let me put this together. So you're 20, your girlfriend gets pregnant. Yeah. You get married. No, not my girlfriend. That, did you plan on being a father at 20 or was that just something that happened? No. The easy fix when you get pregnant is to have an abortion. You can do it. And uh, we were going to do that. And uh, Are you guys in college at the time? Or you yeah. Just, yeah. Okay. Yeah, in college, working at P.F. Chang's. Um, and this was going to be the fix. And it didn't seem like that was a bad idea at yeah. the time. Welcome to The Cigar Preacher. I'm a pastor in Arizona, and for years, I've enjoyed great conversations over cigars. Today, my guest is Kyle Brown. Kyle is the president and chief investment officer of Trinity Capital, a venture capital company listed on the NASDAQ. Kyle is a husband and father of five, and he's gone through an amazing journey to get to where he is today. Join Kyle and I as we talk about cigars, life, and what matters most. I'm Chad Moore, and I'm the Cigar Preacher. Okay, when's the last time you had a cigar? Two days ago. Really? Two days ago? Yeah, I don't smoke them often, but my neighbor does, and he invited me over. Let's do uh, Oliva today. This is an Oliva Milanio. Now you got to rip this thing off before you smoke it, right? That's what they do? Yeah, so technically, um, etiquette is you take the label off. Some people do, some people don't. No, we got to do that, so we'll sit down and... Cut them and take the labels off. All right, we're good. So what is, uh, do you have a favorite cigar? Do you know cigars enough to know what your favorite is? No, you're going to call me out on cigars. I'm around cigars. A lot of friends love cigars. I'm more of a social cigar smoker. Well, it's not about the cigar. It's about the friendship. Yeah. Do you have, do you have a best cigar memory? On a uh, back road trip that we took with Wilderness Collective which is an amazing organization that does these wild adventures. We went from Sequoia National Park to Yosemite on fire roads. Didn't see another soul the whole time, camped. We now, did wait a, a second, like a street bike or like a dirt bike? No, a uh, 250 Honda dirt bike. Okay. But I hadn't been on a bike for a long time. I was 25, 26. I wasn't just trying to keep up. I was trying to beat everybody. Yeah. As if it was a competition. It wasn't. We're doing these switchbacks coming down this mountain. And I'm, I'm kind of hitting them, you know, coming around these corners and it's pretty fun. And my back tire starts sliding and then I braked. I, I accidentally braked and I just, you know, the whole bike slides out. I just, I fly over the cliff. And I, I'm telling you, God had created a bush that in the form of a catcher's mitt about 10 feet down and I just landed in it. You go off of the edge. I go off the edge. You land in a bush. 10 feet down, there's a bush, and it just, and I, I hurt myself. I, I landed hard in it. Yeah. And that's when I hurt it in, herniated the disc in my back. Could you do the rest of the trip? Yeah, it just hurt really bad. Okay. So they didn't like fly helicopters in no, because you couldn't walk. No, it was like a slight herniation that just got worse over time. But um, the end of that trip, I was, I was ready to be done with that trip. Even though it was amazing, beautiful, and an adventure. Sure. We, are um, we end up at, well, we're looking Half Dome, and somebody busted out some cigars. And after Kong, and, you know, finishing something that was difficult, and it was just a, a great adventure, having that stogie, overlooking Half Dome, that was, that's my favorite cigar. Don't know what cigar it was. Yeah. But a good memory. Just a great memory. What about you? We'll, we'll go with this one. So I went, uh, this is a couple of years ago, I was fly fishing, and uh, we're waiting in the river. So we got waders on, we're standing in the river. Yeah. And I'm, I'm casting out, have you ever fly fished? Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm casting out and, and letting it drift. Uh -huh. So it's not dry fly. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're nymph fishing is what they call it. So I'm letting it drift down. We got out of the boat. We're in the water waiting and it drifted way downstream, uh, like way downstream and, and a trout hit it, a, a big, uh, brown trout. Yeah. So I got it, and uh, my buddy's there, the guide's there, and they're thinking, there's no way you're going to land this fish. I mean, it's just too far, and the fish runs downstream. Yeah. So long story medium, about 
20 minutes later, I'm not exaggerating, we landed that fish and I, I got it back <laughs> up river. The guide goes tearing down there with the net, splashing, you know, grabs the fish and all of us are like going nuts, right? Yeah. And then we went and uh, got pictures and all that. And then we went and sat on the bank and had lunch and had a cigar. Oh, yeah. And uh, that was pretty fantastic. Yeah. So you hurt your back. I used to think people that whined about back pain were just being, you know, pansies. <laughs> and, then, and then it happened to me. Oh, no. And then you like fold over and you're on the floor and you can't move. Like, is that, is that how it was for you for a while? For the, yeah, for like seven years. I still struggle with some stuff, but I, uh, I uh, for the most part, get to do what I want to do. Because you, I mean, you're pretty athletic. I mean, you look really athletic sitting next to me. Yeah, I, uh, I've got, you know, I've got a lot of kids and they're active and it's fun to be able to do stuff with them. That's kind of what I, I'm always thinking about when it comes to just health and wellness. Like I want to do stuff yeah. for a long time. Yeah. So yeah, that's good. And my wife wouldn't go on a date with me unless I could surf. So, and, and that's her favorite thing to do. So you can't surf and not stay in decent, decent shape if you want to actually do that. So you learned how to surf to date your wife? I learned how to surf to get a date with my To get a date. How long did that take you? A month. I asked her, I, I said, hey, you and I, we should go on a date. And she said, no. And I said, why? She said, because you're from Phoenix, Arizona, and you don't surf, and I live at the beach, and I've always thought I'd marry a dude that loved Jesus, was taller than you, and could surf. I had to come back to Phoenix, and there's a wave park, and, and at 5 p.m., they kick all the kids out, yeah. and, and 30 dudes that are older get out there with these big boards, and they shoot off a one-foot wave every five minutes, and it's very difficult, but you can, you can pop up, and, and so I did this. Every, like, I did this a couple of days a week until I could figure out how to pop up and surf. Yeah. And, and so I called her and I said, hey, I can surf now. I would like to come get that date. Was that your first date? Or you showed her a video of you doing it? No, I went out with her. Okay. I drove out there, went out there with her, and there was no waves. And I swear to you, this is a true story. Uh, she went in. She said, hey, listen, we'll just, it's like a pity. She's like, it's okay. You came, drove all the way out here. Like, let's go on a date. You know, I, I respect that at least, you know. Yeah. She went into shore, and me, I'm, I can be prideful at times, right? And this was one of those times I'm like, no way. This is not going down like this. And I seriously turned around. I'm like, God, true story. God, send a wave right now. Just send something right now. And I'm not kidding you. Ten seconds later, boop, little tiny wave pops up. I start paddling. I pop up. I mean, I probably look, it probably looked like a hor horrible wave, but I got up. And she was kind of doing this on shore, and, you know, I got my date. Nice. I drove to downtown Phoenix to visit Kyle at his company, Trinity Capital. Hey. Welcome hey, to Trinity. Man. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Yeah. Wow. Looking forward to seeing it. Did you have a moment where you were, because not every business leader is thinking, especially entrepreneurs, thinking healthy culture. Yeah. Was there a moment where you were like, we've got to make a shift here as you kind of thought about the long run? And when, when, did, the, when did the culture switch flip for you in yeah. the sense of importance? Um, for me, it was a long time ago with the previous business where I had a really poor culture. Okay. And, uh, and the focus certainly was not on the people, it was more on the profit. And then with Trinity, it, was, it really came into effect when we, when we decided we were gonna scale and grow the business. You can only do so much on your own. Yeah. And maybe I'm just greedy, but I wanted to do something bigger than just me. There's something about empowering and serving people that is just really satisfying. Yeah. When you learned how to surf, then you charmed her, and here you are. How many kids do you have? Five kids. 17, 15, four, two, and we have a baby coming in, in February. 17, 15, four, two, and a baby. Yeah. Got your hands full. Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's great most of the time, and sometimes it's crazy. And 17-year-old daughter, how's, how's that going, Dad? I think, I'm learning, I think I'm learning a lot right now. I mean, listening 
and not fixing things. I mean, oh my gosh, I just want to fix everything because it's very fixable if you ask me. Sure. Like she has a problem, you got the answer. Yeah. I mean, the answer is right there. It's obviously very clear, but that's not, that's not the point sometimes. Yeah. It's to be heard and understood. And I don't even know what I'm saying right now. That's where I'm at. Like, <laughs> Do you me to give you a, a preacher line? Yeah, please. All right, man. To listen is to love. Yeah. So, so you're wanting to fix it and she's wanting you to listen. Right. I might use that again. And somebody's going to think I have wisdom. That's yeah, not mine. I probably got it from somewhere. This summer we did look at colleges and then we, we looked at preschools. <laughs> in, the, in the same summer. So it is a little bit weird. But I'm actually pretty excited about it. You know, I had, I had my daughter and my son when I was 20, 21 years old. And uh, you started early. Started early. And it's hard, to, it's hard to just navigate life when you're 20, much less, you know, be a father and, yeah. a, and a husband. And so... That, did you plan on being a father at 20 or was that just something that happened? No. I'd say I was probably not a great dad early on. So as it, you know, um, when I talk about having kid, having another round of kids, like I have loved being a father and I've learned to be a father that I think my kids like me and I'm friends with them and uh, we have a good relationship and I haven't screwed them up too much. I hope. Yeah. yeah. So let me put this together. So you're 20, your girlfriend gets pregnant. Yeah. You get married. No, not my girlfriend. Hey, girl. Just a girl. Oh, just a girl. Yeah. And you married her. Mm hmm. Okay. Because we're Baptists, the Browns, and that's, <laughs> that's your background. That, that's, that's what you do when you screw up uh, and get somebody pregnant is you marry them. Okay. And then that makes it right. So, so you just own that screw up for the rest of your life, for better or worse. Yeah. Um, but but it, it, so here's the interesting thing, right? So you look back at that, and I didn't mean for that to happen. I mean, we use the word screw up. But, I mean, your daughter is a phenomenal oh, yeah. person. Oh, yeah. She's fantastic. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there, do, you, do you think even, even in the middle of all that, like, like God was in that? Oh, listen. So I remember, uh, so true story. And I, I, Kylie knows, knows this story too, but we, uh, the easy fix when you get pregnant is to have an abortion. You can do it. And uh, we were going to do that. And, uh, Are you guys in college at the time? Or you yeah, just, yep. Okay. Yeah, in college, working at P.F. Chang's. Um, and this was going to be the fix and it didn't seem like that was a bad idea at yeah. the time. And, uh, and so actually we were set to, to have an abortion, like let's say the next day. And, um, my dad's a good guy. He's a good Christian guy. Like he's a good father, grandfather, of 13 kids. He was, you know, he got to the point where he was kind of like, you should probably just have an abortion. And which to me just blew my mind. Just, just looking at the situation and what it would mean. And yeah. 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 And I, would, I never in a million years would have thought I'd, I'd hear those words from my father. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's just all of a sudden the justification became even more firm. You know, yeah. just like, all right, I don't want this problem. It's going to be really hard. This is going to screw my life up. And my dad's okay with it. So I could do that. The day before we're going to have this abortion, he ended up coming over to my apartment and he, he broke down and just said, Kyle, I, I, I screwed up. I should have never told you that. It was wrong. This is not the end of anything for you. It's really the beginning. And you have an incredible opportunity to raise this child and bring this child in the world. Love it. You know? So, so he shows me this little plastic doll. I always remember this. Got me, got me crying now. It's the cigar. I swear, it's too much smoke. Um, smoke gets in your eyes. Yeah, smoke gets in your eyes. Um, this little plastic doll, and you know, this baby was, I don't know, eight weeks old at this point, something like that. And you know, like hands me this little doll. He's like, "This is what your child looks like right now, at, at eight weeks." Wow. And you're just I'm looking at it going, "Oh my gosh!" Like this is a real baby. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, smoke's getting my, in my eyes. Yeah. And so, I mean, went through that night and we just, we decided we were not going to have that abortion. And, uh, you know, Kylie's mother decided that as well. And, and we decided to just kind of commit to this child, um, commit to each other as best we knew how. Yeah. And figure it out. Yeah. And that was the beginning of, the, you know, becoming a dad. 
Yeah, wow. Uh, yeah, so from God's perspective, there's accidental parents, but there are no accidental children. Right. It sounds like that's kind of where you guys went. Yeah. And so that's, that was a hard conversation to have with my daughter, which I, th- I thought she was old enough to have it. Mm. When did you tell her? Uh, so she's 17 now? Yeah, I'd say maybe a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, I think it started with so I'm like an accident to like, baby girl, you, you have no idea um, how amazing and what a blessing you've been to not just me, but this whole family. Yeah, and how, and how God kind of reached down yeah. and did that work in your dad and then did that work in you and then did that work in your oh, ex-wife yeah. and yeah. yeah. And, it, and it, you know, I don't know what today would look like if that, that decision wasn't made. Yeah, what would you tell somebody that, um, you know, is, is in the situation that you were in at, you said 19, 20? 19, yeah. Yeah, maybe somebody's in a situation like that. Would you, having walked through that, like have a piece of advice if maybe even they're thinking about making that abortion decision? Well, yeah. I, when, I, when I hold my baby girl, <laughs> it's, it's very clear to me that that was the right decision. Absolutely. And uh, uh, well, I couldn't imagine not having her. Yeah. So what I say, I'd say there's, you know, there's light, there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's not, you know, that pain is, doesn't last. I feel like, I feel like the, the way I've prayed more, even more recently has changed because, you know, I don't, I've always kind of prayed, God, you know, protect me from this. Help me with that, you know. Um, protect and bless, protect and bless. Bless, you know, bless me, Lord. Yeah. I feel like anymore, and it kind of goes back to the very beginning, it's just really just got to pray for like, get me through this thing. Like, <laughs> like, give me patience. Yeah. You know, because that's what that person needs in that moment. It's like, patience. I mean, you made a mistake. Don't make any more mistakes. Yeah. Stop. Slow down. Yeah, I, I think, and I, and I do this too, I, I think we're all praying for comfort. Yeah. And God wants to work on our character. Mm. And, and the problem with character work is it's, it's usually the harder decision. Yeah. But it's the better decision. It's the right decision. And, and the blessing of that character shift is over the long haul. Thus, yeah. you made the harder choice but the right choice, and now you're holding your 17-year-old daughter who's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, when you think about, um, I mean, obviously, successful business moving forward, up and to the right, just went public not too long ago. How do you balance all of that with your family? Because you have a couple of really little kids at home. Yeah. And then you have a couple of older kids. Yeah. Um, I don't know. And you don't know you, how you balance if you, it? If you figure that out, please let me know. Um, no, I, I don't know. Uh, I can tell you what I'm trying to do, which is just, you know, kind of set boundaries on when I'm working and when I'm not working. Yeah. I mean, something simple like that where I'm not taking calls after a certain time. That's good. Um, and, and that doesn't always work, right? Mm-hmm. And there's going to be the call that comes and you got to take it. You got to do it. But scheduling in advance, kind of owning my time. Yeah. On the whole balance thing, that, that obviously doesn't exist. Everybody that tries to do it, it never it never works. Yeah. People sell books and say that balance, but, but life doesn't work that way. Oh, yeah. Uh, you don't balance winter and summer at the same time. Yeah. Those are two very different seasons. Mm-hmm. And so when I think about it, I don't think balance, I think rhythm. Yeah. So there are certain seasons where, frankly, family's not first. Oh, yeah. It, it is big picture, but functionally not in that season. Sure. Because you're, you're making things happen. Yeah. And so what you do, and you said this, is you, is you think about your calendar and you think about your schedule. Well, if this is crazy busy season, right after that, it's going to be a really fun family season. Uh, we're in two very different worlds, but it's been something that's really helped me. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. You guys have, have your daughter, your oldest daughter, and you decide to get married. And you're working at P.F. Chang's. <laughs> yeah. So did this, like, motivate you to... 
maybe start doing something else besides PF Changs? Did you get serious about school? What did, what did you decide to do? Because now, now you got to provide for a wife and a kid. Yeah. Uh, no. I, I definitely was motivated. Um, it was scared. I wasn't motivated. I was scared. Scared, yeah. Uh, well, that motivates you. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, I remember getting down on my knees and praying like, God, I don't know what to do. I'm so screwed. You know, I'm literally... <laughs> I'm literally going, I'm at P.F. Chang's, and I'm not even a server. I'm a busser. <laughs> Please, God, like, help me, you know. And uh, I had been reading this book Robert Kiyosaki wrote uh, called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah, I know that book. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to make, I'm going to flip houses. Like, I'm going to do some, I'm going to buy homes with no money down, <laughs> and I'm going to make a lot of money doing that. I went to this. Uh, it's cash flow. It's called cash flow. It's it's a rich dad poor dad like monopoly game that he made. Yeah, they do these groups that meet up around town. You play the game and you talk about real estate and you network. <laughs> now, are you like scared when you do this? Oh yeah, you're like just showing up to give it a shot. Oh yeah, everybody's forty something years old. Yeah, I'm twenty. Yeah, um, it's impressive. It's impressive that you would just break through that and go do that. No, dude, it's just desperate. <laughs> just yeah. desperate you know you're making 13 bucks an hour you're desperate you got a baby coming yeah i'm playing this game i'm competitive so i'm trying to win you know i'm trying to and i'm sitting next to this big guy named bob look like a walrus you know this bald dude big beard you know just look like a walrus and i like him already yeah he's, he's just the nicest guy and he's we struck up a conversation he goes hey i like you i'm like okay you know he goes i'm a mortgage broker and uh, I could use some help. You want to work for me? And I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Um, when can I, I start? This is your first meeting? Yes. This guy, Bob, he was a um, mechanical engineer by trade. He used, to, um, he used to build airplanes. And he was methodical just about process and systems. And, and so I sat behind a guy who actually knew what he was doing. And I learned from him um, the right way. And uh, he taught me how to, uh, how to build a mortgage business just from the ground up. And no joke, within six months, I, I was closing loans. And uh, I had started a, a mortgage company and was, you know, I, I wasn't doing very well, but I was making some money. You started your own company. Yeah. How old were you at this point? Still 20. At 20. Yeah. Okay. And by the time that baby was born, I had some regular income coming in. A real modest, but it was, it was something, the flywheel was moving, you yeah. know, and I was learning. Yeah. So you're doing, you're doing cold calls, you're doing yep. anything you can do. Yeah. And where did, where did that take you? So I did that. I did that for uh, uh, six years leading up to the uh, real estate crash yeah. of 08. And... Uh, and then that, when that crash happened, I lost everything. I, uh, my mortgage business was gone. I had started to do my own loans. I had raised a little bit of money from, from individuals, and I was lending it out uh, for guys that were fixing flipping homes. And I just, I just lost. I lost everything. But I, I got it, almost everybody. I, I think I got everybody their money back, at least. I just personally lost everything. Uh, what was going on with your wife and daughter in that time? So I, I would say I was not all that present. I was like the 5 a.m. to 7 p.m., you know, working. Going for your goal of yep. being a millionaire. Um, I never learned how to be a husband, and I wasn't that present. You know, just really struggled in that marriage. Really struggled. And very volatile relationship, um, which climaxed kind of in 2009, right around the real estate crash. There was a, there was a, there was a point where I... Uh, my wife, you know, at the time she left me, wanted a divorce, was done. And within six months, uh, I lost my business as well. So literally within a few months, I went from thinking I had, you know, I was the man and I had accomplished everything to, uh, you know, uh, single and and losing my business, everything, yeah, pretty much. 
I, you know, I, I had this moment, it was the worst moment for me coming out of all of that, where I'm like, I'm in this crappy little house. I'm just trying to figure out how do I rebuild business again? How do I rebuild, rebuild my life? And um, I'm sitting at home, it's probably midnight, and I'm, I wanna go to sleep, but I'm just sitting there, literally just on Facebook, I think, and uh, feeling horrible about myself and my life and crying. I get a little like beep, you know, somebody poked me or something back then. Remember the uh, Facebook or, or uh, DM me? I don't know. It was my old basketball coach from high school. He goes, Kyle, how are you doing? And I'm like, I'm doing so good. How are you? <laughs> how are you doing, man? <laughs> Life's just great. And uh, the social media is so real, right? Oh, yeah. No, I'm just yeah. I'm just telling him what's up. And uh, he goes, hey, you're going to think this is weird, but I just had this dream about you. I woke up, sitting here next to Stacy. His name's Trent. And uh, I'm like, I need to call Kyle like, and tell him that God loves him. And, wow. uh, and like, he's, he's there. Like, he's, he hadn't forgot about you. And he tells me this. And, oh, my gosh. In a moment where I am just absolutely at, my, at the bottom, I just so, that is so weird. I mean, I, I have a hard time believing things unless they're just boom, solid, you know, yeah, numbers. I think we're all that way. Yeah. And I mean, that hit me right across my face, just going, oh, wow. What are you, what are you doing now? Long story short, I, I signed up to, you know, help my dad build this business called Trinity Capital. He had this vision of creating the best, best in the world lending business to tech companies. And I knew lending, I knew man managing money. I was an entrepreneur. The idea of lending money to entrepreneurs sounded really interesting to me. We've built a team from, you know, less than 10 people to nearly 50 people today. Based in Phoenix, we've got people in Boston and Austin and San Francisco. Um, and then uh, earlier this year, we, uh, we took the company public on the NASDAQ. It feels like this, it's all led to this. It's kind of the beginning, yeah. really, of something. I had a mentor. Tell me 10 years ago, I said, so what do you want to do in 10 years? I'm like, I want to run a, a big company. He's like, no, <laughs> you're, not, <laughs> you're not going to do that. And I said, well, why? He goes, because all you care about is the deal, you know? Yeah, uh, you're an entrepreneur. How are you going to run a company? Yeah, you're good at starting things and then passing them off. I'm like, well, I want to run a, I want to run a business. Yeah. He's like, well, then you need to care about people. Um, and you got to care about people more than you care about yourself. Yeah. And you got to learn how to invest in people the way you invest in a deal and time. And so that's been my favorite part about Trinity has been um, building something that's much bigger than yourself by bringing great people around, investing in them, and then seeing what, seeing what happens, yeah. you know, and, and, and assisting them and helping. If I was to boil it down, it would just be love people, care about people, one of our core values is uncommon care, providing um, and caring about people above and beyond what they contribute to you. Yeah, that's good. And uh, it seems to be working okay. Yeah. Good for you, man. Thanks, buddy. I want to thank Kyle for joining us today. You know, in all the ups and downs of his life, the lesson was simple. You don't really start to live until you live for something bigger than yourself. Join us next time as we talk about cigars, life, and what matters most on The Cigar Preacher.